Yes, thank you for coming. And you got on right away. Everything's working. <laughs> it's always the, the first few minutes are the hard part, making sure everybody gets on. Yes. Everything is ready. <laughs> Everything is wonderful with French Accorta, right? <laughs> with, with good friends, especially, and good wine also. Yes, that's very true. Very true. Well, welcome. Um, welcome to our guests, to, our, to all of our the people are listening. Um, I'll go ahead and kick off the session. We're a minute or two early, but that's okay. Um, and lots of people are logging on. We got a nice big audience here. So anyway, uh, my name is Karen Wetzel and I occasionally host Instagram Live for the Napa Valley Wine Academy. I'm also an instructor there. And just tell you a little bit about the Napa Valley Wine Academy for those of you who may not know who we are. We are the, um, we are the world leader of WSET education. We, we have more WSET students than anybody except for WSET London. Um, all of our wine kits for WSET include great wine kits, so you can actually taste while you learn, even for the online classes. Be sure and follow us on our newsletter. Just go to our website, napvalleywineacademy.com, and sign up for our newsletter. You'll learn about all this type of thing, any free webinars, any, any new courses, all kinds of great promotions there. So um, anyway, check us out there. And without further ado, I want to introduce my special guest today. I'm so excited. Jamario Villa, and he is the French Accorda brand ambassador, as well as a master taster and an amazing wine educator. You guys are in for a treat. Welcome, Jamario. How are you? Thank you. I'm wonderful. Thank you. Good. <laughs> That's for, great. Thank you for having me. My Accorda. pleasure. And make your morning special and the late afternoon here in Italy even more for people ready for aperitivo. Yes, that's right. Well, nothing like nothing like French Accorda at 10 a.m. <laughs> and I'm sure at five at five p.m. It's or what is it? Five p.m. There? Seven? Eight, no. Yes. It, yeah. So I'm sure it's even better. I think there's a little delay, so I'm uh, I, I'll try not to talk over you because then they can't hear you. So I'll be very careful of that. So well, let's get started. Let's jump right on in. So tell us. Tell us about who you are, where you're from, where you're living. Give us, give us the lowdown on who on uh, Jamario. Okay, um, where uh, I'm, I'm Italian born and, and California based. Um, I'm actually in Italy as we speak because after a long time I managed to be back here in my hometown, Rimini, in the Emilia Romagna region. And I'm actually going to be in Francia Corta next week for some uh, visiting and meetings. And uh, I just really uh, found the joy of being in the old world uh, and seeing friends and family. I actually, this is where I started off. I started off as a journalist right here in Rimini. And uh, I was 1999, I believe, before I graduated in political science. And it was, you know, as often happened, for people in the wine world, you always come from a previous life. My previous life was journalism and advertising. And uh, I really enjoyed my time. And at some point, I think Italy was too tight. And uh, I discovered New York City. And before that, and this is actually a good uh, suggestion for the students that you guys have. You have a wonderful academy and great courses. I decided to take my third level professional certified sommelier degree uh, just because I wanted to enjoy my vacation and getting to know areas of the world, what to drink, what to eat. And I kept in my pocket my degree. And uh, I arrived in New York. I started as a columnist uh, talking about the wine and food scene in New York, interviewed and so forth. And at some point I took off my pocket my degree of sommelier and I found a job as a wine director. And that's how yeah. I started especially in my career in U.S., uh, in a couple of restaurants in Manhattan. Wow, that's great. And, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up because one of the things that I do at the Napa Valley Wine Academy is I, um, I do some career coaching. And I tell people, you know, sometimes the jobs are when you least expect it or you take a path that you weren't necessarily planning on. And you, jobs, you know, those careers find you sometimes. And I think that's I think that's great. We have uh, oh, Mindy, one of our influencers, is on today. I wanted to say hi. Lots we have lots of friends, Jamario, on. We have a lot of the academy people. We've got lots of followers. You have lots of followers here. They're all saying hi. So it's we have quite a large group, which is very exciting. 
So um, yeah, so that's so that's great. And so you're you're in Italy for how long? How much longer? Um, just uh, one more month, and I'm going to be back in California, where I moved in the 2008, and where I start my career as a wine educator, actually um, master taster, and I, I taught for a few different uh, academies and schools. I work with some wine importers and distributors. Because I like, I like to keep a wide perspective on the wine world and, and uh, observing from different point of view what's going on. And in order to understand better, communication, as you know, is not on the person that is talking, is on the audience listening and understanding. So I always try to challenge myself wearing different shoes and trying to, um, to experience the wine world uh, on a different level from, from simple, easy, drinking to more technical uh, environment, academic environment, because I do believe coming from Italy, coming from an area like this one, Emilia Romagna, that wine should be democratic as a word. There should be a democratic approach, not a luxury of wine, not the exclusivity of enjoying wine, but a, a, a daily habit with moderation where you discover, of course, Franciacorta and the wonderful areas of Italy as, re as the rest of the world, be exposed to the simplicity and the excellence in order to understand what is in between and fill your own gaps. Yes, that's wonderful. That's so important. And that's such a great point. It's, wine doesn't have to be exclusive. It's all inclusive, really. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's wine made all over the world. There's wine sold all over the world. And uh, I tell people that in, in my career coaching is you can find a wine job almost anywhere doing something, right? So. So that's great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Now, uh, I, just quick question. Did you or do you work uh, with UCLA or didn't you do some work for UCLA I, or do I have that wrong? Uh, yeah, no, I, I am currently a lecturer and I offer twice a year a course focused on the Renaissance uh, period and the wine and food pairing Italian courts of Northern Italy. And more in particular, we analyze the famous wedding of uh, some famous cities like uh, Florence or uh, Mantova, Rimini, Bologna, Venice. So uh, my, my study is focused on what uh, Bartomelo Scappi, for example, one of the most important uh, chefs at the time, did in order to announce the wine and what kind of wine was served and what the, the surrounding were like. So that's the today. And instead, about 15 years ago or so, I started extension and I ran for about 10 years uh, a few different wine courses there and uh, teaching is part of me it's my form of art if you wish <laughs> so I put foot into the teaching world we are we're cooking with a Napa Valley Wine Academy a few recipes for our students for the fall and winter nice so back in different uh, you know, different uh, best if you want but yes UCLA and other academies and that actually gave me the energy and the and the strength to keep studying you never stop studying right you never stop. and being challenged by by important questions by classes is always a way to learn myself every day from someone else yes great yeah that's a great great way to look at things and yes we never we never stop learning right we so that's know. that's wonderful. Well, let's talk about French Accorda. And, and I'm going to say, you know, we have a lot of very knowledgeable students um, and we have a lot of very knowledgeable people on online today. But I'll bet we have a few people who aren't really sure what French Accorda is as well. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about French Accorda, where it's located, history, whatever you want to tell us. Yeah, let, let's keep it as a conversation with a certain yes. aspect of a technical approach. Well, Francia Corta, first of all, uh, it's one of the few words that express multiple meanings. So Francia Corta is a geographical area. Francia Corta is a wine district. Francia Corta is a wine style. When you mention Francia Corta, you mention a wine characterized by a second fermentation in the barrel, more specifically a classic. Metodo Classico Francia Corta, and is the only DOCG in Italy, born in 1995, exclusively focused on Metodo Classico. This is one of the many peculiarities of Francia Corta. And uh, we are far from the charming south, the sunny Mediterranean areas. Uh, we are actually all the way in the deep north, uh, 
the background, the Russian Alps, here is the map of Italy, Lombardy region, in the northern portion of the Lombardy region near the municipality of Brescia. And it's a beautiful amphitheater-shaped uh, district where you have on the west a river, Oglio River, on the north, the Lake Iseo, one of, or Iseo, <laughs> one of the most beautiful glacier lake nearby Lake of Como, Lake of Garda, the beautiful lakes of Lombardy. And uh, you see the Russian Alps and Switzerland uh, very close by. So we are in the deep north. And this is giving to this district a wonderful combination of complexity in the elements. Uh, we often talk, and we're going to talk more later, about how wine is affected from the human factor and mother nature. And here, mother nature gives the best altitude, high altitude, high latitude also, being the north, presence of the lake, wind from the Alps, uh, mitigation effect from the lakes, uh, a, a wonderful national park with the vineyard seeded. It, it's really, I feel like a promo. That, for is this the park you're talking about? That's what I'm talking about. Is this is a national park um, where you can visit and the vineyards are all the way into the lake and you see the the Russian Alps in the background, so you can picture how incredible is that little shell of land. Um, so we are in the deep north, uh, and uh, size-wise, we're about a little over 70 square miles, 77 or something square miles, so a very tiny area. And we have about 7,500 acres, uh, three times more than the Napoleonic era. So uh, there were about 1,000 hectares at that time, and now there are about 3,000 hectares, 7,600 acres. So it's a pretty small area for a total production of 17, 18 million bottles. Uh, the consortium oversees a little over 100 producers. So it is an area still focused on small family-owned boutique producer with, of course, a few major players, as often happen. So it's a pretty interesting area, and from, from we're going to talk more later about the organic, but over 60% are organic certified, which is an incredible number compared to the total size of the vineyards there. That's amazing. That's really, that's really amazing. Um, so, you know, I, you talk about the history and, and talk about, you know, the culture and, and give, give us a, a, sense of, a sense of who Franciacorta was and is today. Yeah. First of all, why Franciacorta? The etymology always tells you a lot about an area. So Francia Corta, I will just give you like three, four dates. It's not an historical class. I'm going to be quickly turning to a nerd if I talk about history. But <laughs> Trinian monks, thank God, thank actually to the monks. Trinian monks, <laughs> Persian monks uh, they, they arrived in Francia Corta because, of course, since the Roman times, they were making wine. But when they arrived, that area turned into a business area where they were actually making wine, of course, to supply the religious needs, but also to sell. So they turned into Corte Franche, free from taxation. Franco means free and Corte are courts. So courts area, free from the exempted from the taxation, a key point to develop a business anywhere in the world, anytime in the history. And uh, I will say a, a key date is the 39th as a century, 12 centuries something, uh, um, for the first time we see the word Franza Curta spelled, written in a local register. And that's important because often we hear about the long history of an area making wine, but we don't have any written record. So having a written record endorses also, and it is more meaningful, right? Mm -hmm. um, Shortly after 15-something, a wonderful chronicle uh, made by Girolamo Conforti officialized, if you want, the area famous to be producing fizzy wines. Actually, he used the word mordacious wines, mordaci. And uh, for the first time, actually, we have the, 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 the sense of what is today a, a wine made in Metodo Classico. A couple more dates. I mentioned Napoleon earlier. Uh, in 1809, the Napoleon army registered and tracked all the vineyards at the time. And they note that over a thousand hectares, so about a third of today's uh, total surface, were already put in place to produce sparkling wine, fizzy wines. Of course, different stylistically from today. But uh, that's the path from the 
from the lively purple wine of the Middle Ages, then we go into the later Renaissance and then the 1900s for the even more sparkle effect. And then we have in 1960, uh, Mr. Zigliani, Franco Zigliani, producing the first Pinot Franciacorta. We're going to spoil the grapes later, okay, when we talk about the styles. But from then on, is a quick uh, climbing up. Uh, 1960, Zigliani released the first Pinot Franciacorta. 67, the DOC. 1995, DOCG. So as you see, the legislator start regulating pretty quickly in the early 60s uh, the, the, the methodology of production. And today, Consortio Francia Corta oversees the production, the characteristic of the wine, what happened before and after, if you want, the bottling. Yeah, okay. Well, that's, yeah, so, so I don't think people, you know, you're saying um, uh, Metodo Classico. And that's, in essence, that's traditional method, right? That's the sa same. But when did that start? Was it before or after Champagne? <laughs> Um, I won't, I won't go into the competition or the, <laughs> the Come on. <laughs> um, I can tell you this, um, the tradition starts off as a fizzy wine and ends up in the technology of today. You can have Metodo Classico, Metodo Antigo, uh, Metodo, Metodo tradi Traditional, method, uh, in different parts of the world, Spain, Portugal, uh, Champagne, of course, in France, uh, in Italy. Uh, but we're talking about second fermentation in bottle. What makes a difference? What makes a difference are, as we know, the bubbles, okay? The, the finesse, the number of the bubble, the persistence of the bottle, then the yeast, which are our big friends. Every kind of yeast is different area to area. And of course, the length of the fermentation. In France, we go from a minimum of 18 to a maximum of 60 months, which is an incredible amount of time. Wow. I'm going to revisit that. Who came first? Who knows? I think what matters is who's making a delicious wine. Uh, <laughs> we, are, uh, we are talking about a tiny area compared to the importance of Champagne. Yeah. We're also talking about an area that uh, gained the fame of incredible quality across the board, across the producer. Um, and uh, I like it to keep seeing that way. Okay, no competitors. Yeah. Competitors. Right. Well, and, and I think that that's a fair point. And, and I guess what I was, what, what I feel like I successfully drew out of you was that French Accorta and the Matoro Classicos have similar histories and have been around for as long as Champagne. And they have, you know, all of that, that, uh, that historic joy to them, I guess you could say. And so I just, you know, I, I guess that, that more than just making a wine in that traditional method, you know, like we do here in California, there's, you know, we have several producers that make traditional method sparkling wine, but we don't have the history where French Accorta has that same, that same lineage or similar, you know, similar story to tell as Champagne does. And so you're oh. really in such great company. Uh, Two, two little things. Uh, one is the, 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 the local tradition, the, the local makes a big difference. They traditionally drink that kind of wine. So the, the, the tradition led into the technology. And the other thing is um, the, the, the only area that I'm aware that is specifically, exclusively making as a method of classical is Francia Corta. You have wonderful classical around Italy, absolutely. North to South Islands included, there is also a trend if you want. But in Francia Corta, you have the exclusivity of Metodo Class, which makes even more special. They're focused. Right, right. That's great. Wonderful. Well, great. Well, let's talk about, um, how about we talk about the grapes? You had sort of alluded to that a few minutes ago, and maybe let's move on to the grapes and the style. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting thirsty, so maybe we need to have a taste. Let's, 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 mention, uh, let's mention the grapes, and then we can maybe have the first tasting. First of all, the grapes are uh, Pinot Nero. Let, let's pronounce it in Italian, Pinot Nero. Chardonnay, Pinot Bianco, up to 50%, and Herba Mat, up to 10%, which is the, the latest arrival. Actually, from 2020 vintage on, you will find Herba Mat, which is a very uh, 
small production uh, in, exclusively of Francia Corta of a long history over four five hundred uh, years and was recently rediscovered a, a grape with uh, a lot of acidity late ripener so the idea to keep a 10 percent up to 10 percent in, in the blend is to enhance a local indigenous varietal but also do not cover with excess of the acidity the bouquet of the wine um, uh, very briefly, and then we can taste the first wine. Uh, we have uh, Francia Corta, uh, quote unquote, regular, uh, which is 18 months minimum of aging. Then we have a Satin, which is very, very popular lately. A wine characterized, actually, we have a great article in the Napa Valley Wine Academy website. If you Google uh, Satin article, Napa Valley Wine Academy. And also a great podcast with Christian Ogenfuss, uh, we did together, where we talk extensively about Satin. A wine with a very uh, high tactile presence. A wine that's particularly creamy, lower atmosphere, blanc de blanc, no use of herba mat. Um, very, very fresh, very creamy, very wonderful texture. The word per se, Satin, combine the, the satinato, the silky taste uh, uh, of, of the wine. And then we have um, uh, all the way up to the Reserva and the uh, Satin Reserva wine age up to six months. Uh, so you can see how... You're saying six zero, not six, six zero. You know, we go from 24 months of the Rosé, we go up to 30 months uh, of the vintage one. So if you see a vintage in the front label, you know that is at least 13 months of fermentation process in the barrel. Oh. And then Reserva, which is a wonderful drink. Uh, also, mm -hmm. if you climb up in the categories of the wine, you can also dare more on the wine and food painting. When you taste a Reserva with a 60 month of aging, different style, because you range from, from a, a dosage zero uh, all the way through an extra dry and a dry, of course, even the, the most popular production, brut, extra brut normally. But you can dare bigger style, more persistence, more impactful the wine. Bigger right. than, so you can, we're going to talk about food shortly, uh, but it's going to be uh, a more important form of drinking. Uh, right. You were thirsty. I want to pull, <laughs> select a few, a few wines. You, first of all, we have a wonderful uh, tulip shape, Francia Corte, official glass. And um, I don't know if from, from the camera, you can see the difference of color, but we have, uh, on the first uh, wine we're tasting, which is an extra brut vintage 2014, a more of an intense golden color, while the second sample is more on the lighter side of the color. So on a blind tasting, you find easily going in a couple of directions, okay? About the grapes they use and the fermentation process they use. And uh, I want to refresh my glass in order to give more bubbles, wonderful chain of bubbles, very small and fine. Often people ask me like, in general, talking about, uh, about champenoise or Metodo Classico, what makes the wine very special? One of my two answers is uh, the visual. When you observe this kind of fine, small and persistent bubble, you already have uh, the idea of the complexity possibly in the character of the wine. And of course, then I want to double check the facts. So we see golden color. My mind is going straight in the use of Chardonnay, for example, on ripe, on more of a warm feelings, on, on uh, riper notes, but most of all, the oak. So this is a wine with a percentage of... Uh, uh, of the grapes fermented in oak. So that golden color, that vibrant golden color is immediately revealing one of the characteristics of the winemaking. Uh, and then again, when you smell taste, double check your fats. So the color makes sense. That cream that comes out, that nice patisserie cream and then uh, tropical fruits together with, with some herbal notes and hay and, and floral, like, like um, yellow flowers. So mm -hmm. all the, way the wine uh, harmony, which I'm sorry, I'm gonna spend one more moment on this. Something I learned by studying on a certificate program, wine school. So 
through wine is to understand the concept of harmony and the concept of balance, which you can apply in anything, in sport, in work, in life, in love, whatever. Harmony and balance are two ideal goals to achieve. It's hard to find a wine perfectly harmonious and perfectly balanced. It's hard to find someone perfectly harmonious <laughs> and balanced with himself. But maybe it's a, it's a 10 seconds frame in your life when you are right. contemplating something you, you achieve that moment. Like so, finding a unicorn. <laughs> finding a unicorn. <laughs> my daughter might pop out from the floor if you name a unicorn. She's obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> balance between what? Between acidity and other aspects, between fruit and acidity, sugar and acidity, harmony on, on the kind of visual olfactory and taste analysis. So I'm sorry if I went off uh, a moment, but uh, I believe that your students uh, will learn a lot of aspects in the wine courses, but this is something that should be a focus. Maybe the the, 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 the adjective, the terminology will change classes to classes, but the idea is to understand yeah. balance and harmony for me. Yes, I, I want to interrupt for just one quick second before yeah. we actually get to the tasting. First of all, everybody's saying they're jealous because they don't have the wine. So, <laughs> except for Mindy, she has the wine. Um, but, but I wanted I, to mention, I, you know. Get some guests with wine and uh, uh, please follow us, uh, reach out. So at the next tasting, we can send you some, some wine and perhaps some glasses home. Yes, and if you, if you follow the Nep Valley Wine Academy newsletter, this is where you learn about all these free, we do. So I wanted to mention that. You did so, a webinar for us um, a while back, yeah. and that is recorded and it lives, uh, if you go to the NepValleyWineAcademy.com, there's a, a blog tab. So there you will find the article that Jamario mentioned about French Accorta. Um, and then you'll also find the video from the webinar there as well. And you'll and scroll down a little further and you'll find the podcast that Christian, who is online right now with us, um, who uh, Christian interviewed Jamario and fascinating. I listened to all of it. It was really amazing presentations. And then I think you have something coming up with us in the fall maybe? Yeah, we have, we have another, uh, I think it's a Facebook event. I really like the partnership with, with Napa Valley Academy because uh, you guys offer a terrific program and uh, you manage to uh, communicate on a way that I like, which is uh, effective, professional, yet entertaining also. So we're going to have <laughs> that, uh, I believe at the end of September, we're going to follow up on that. And... Okay. Uh, Something more, something more. So we're going to. Yeah. So that's why the newsletter is so important for you guys to follow because that's how you hear about all this. I also want to make one quick mention. Um, if anybody has any questions for Jamario while we're talking, um, you can use that little question mark icon in the bottom of your phone. That's the best place to put it. Uh, you can pop it in the feed, in the chat feed, but it, it gets the chat feeds going pretty quick. So uh, just be a little careful of that. It might get lost in the shuffle. But if you use that little icon, and then periodically I will uh, take a breath and I'll check those out and we'll get those questions to Jamario so he can answer them for you. So feel oh, free to Corta. ask away. We love questions. <laughs> Corta, Ferrari, Ducati, you ask me a question, I'm going to answer. <laughs> As you are, Karen, actually. Yeah, well, my husband is listening in the other room, and he's the big Ferrari fan. He's the big Ferrari fan, so he'll probably be asking something here in a minute. Anyway, okay, so we were in the middle of doing this. I'm sorry I interrupted, but I just want, didn't want to forget to say that. So we were smelling this beautiful wine. Yeah. Can we taste it yet? <laughs> Um, there is definitely that hint, more than a hint of oak, which I'm fine. I always like a small component because I love to see in the major picture the primary aromas. Primary aromas typical of the varietals, so fruit and floral notes, minerality and so forth. If everything tastes as a, as a spice, as oak, uh, it's like enhancing makeup on everybody's uh, face. So it's not about <laughs> seeing the peculiarity of this wine. So I, I really found intrigued the bread crust and the cream and patisserie cream, which is typical of the fermentation process. Yeah. And the, right? And then you start, 
you start um, skiing in between the descriptors <laughs> and switch from the from the uh, the yeasty notes of course all the way to the floral and the fruit so i mentioned i mentioned yellow flowers riper than white flowers i mentioned mm -hmm. tropical fruits so the color is coherent is in harmony with the descriptor a matter of fact when you taste the wine and some of our guests home are lucky enough they received all the samples you will have that uh bright acidity exclusive fundamental in a wine like this but also the creamy texture yes they comp they're so they balance each other so beautifully and i love extra brit style this happens to be the extra brit style and um, I'm looking at the tasting notes. Uh, I don't see where it says the uh, the sugar content, but I just like that super dry style. I like the high acidity. I don't need the sugar to balance it, although I appreciate the other styles, but I always look for those really, really bone dry sparkling. I did my homeworks and I'm not reading. <laughs> Two grams per liter, 48 months of uh, fermentation process, 50-50 Pinot Noir Chardonnay, 20% of barrel aging. Yes. Uh, and uh, um, walking, let's not wait for the food section. I would like to dare, okay, and go for maybe some like some lake fish tagliatelle, so white uh, bechamel base, a, cous a vegetarian couscous. Uh, if you're lucky enough to be in that wonderful uh, Iseo Lake and, and in France Court, of course, go with the tradition, but most of us normally are somewhere else. So I'm a big fan of uh, explaining the traditional pairing and also trying to understand how can we give our own, our own California twist or New York East Coast twist, wherever you are. Right. So, some importance, something with some creaminess, something with some persistence, also something with some fat, because we have low calories, low sugar, high acidity, creamy texture. So ideally we're trying to not overwhelm the dish, but elevate the together yes very from the from the other sample uh, which is instead a brut and in this case we have a, a also a pinot blanc in the in the in the blend a little bit more residual sugar here also because brut allows up to also nine grams per liter um and uh, when i first approached my nose i always found that finesse in the bubbles but the bouquet is a bit more shy because he's expressing no primary aroma. So forget about the oak, forget about the spices and so forth. The ripeness of the fruit, the color is more like green hues and, and a light golden leaf. So it's more about light notes or white floral notes. That apple note typical also of French Accord. And then slowly, some key descriptor I didn't mention so far, shame of me are the nutty aromas, so hazelnut, nuts, uh, macadamia, almonds. Those are also very typical of, of the category of the Metodo Classico in general. So uh, uh, I think something very uh, educative, something very useful in general for a wine lover or a student or, or a pro is to ask yourself, despite the evident note, what else can I find? And, Personally, I like to go back in personal memories. So if I'm looking for floral notes, I try to build in my life an olfactory memory. And I try to read uh, that walk in the field with white flowers or the walk on the seaside with iodine, iodine water and sea salt water. So <laughs> olfactory memory in order to read the different descriptors. At the taste, I'm expecting something sharper than the taste before in case of this brood. Mm -hmm. Beautiful wine. And uh, complexity, nice persistence. The sugar comes out in the aftertaste in this case. And I'm looking for even here, you know, you can, you can space. France Accord, in general, people uh, uh, mistake a bottle of France Accorta or other wines I don't want to mention right now as an aperitif wine, as a wine for celebration. You're happy, you have something to celebrate, you pop the bottle. Or you are having a for dinner, you drink a wine like this. No, I mean, yes, but go beyond that. So go for main courses pairing. 
you can have, I don't know, a, a plate of fried zucchini and fried carrots and, and fried seafood, uh, but also you can go for a cheese polenta, something more structured. Mm-hmm. Because there, when you have these complexities, this persistence, these multiple layers uh, in the glass, you can then there have, uh, I don't know, uh, lobster ravioli with this. Boy, now you're talking my language. <laughs> You know, when you were, you, yeah, you, you said at the beginning, you mentioned a white fish and, yeah. you know, of course, common to the Emilia Romano, but um, I immediately went to Petrali Sole, sauteed with a little bit of lemon and butter. Um, so delicious, just lightly, lightly floured, you know, just give some richness to the fish. And then this wine would be, I think, beautiful with a Petrali Sole. I'm going to echo that on butter, petroleum salt, the first wine with the, the, the ripeness and more importance in the texture. And maybe the salt can be grilled very quickly and served with some parsley on top and you go for a little bit of a lighter version, okay? Mm-hmm. And bread, you can have a breaded uh, um, sole on the open, open fire, on the barbecue, and you yes. go for a rosé, which will be our next wine. So, <laughs> so, I, I think we should play a lot and you know, talk to your chef, talk to your wine uh, helper. Uh, don't bring a bottle, buy a few, cook home, test yourself what goes with what, because we're mm-hmm. here in sort of an academic world talking about the ideal pairing and the ideal description of the wine. Ultimately, I believe in happiness and people home are happy having their own pairing, having their own tradition. A glass of wine we're not judging if you do it right <laughs> right I, I do have a question so um the 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 extra brut was chardonnay and pinot noir yes. the brut was chardonnay pinot noir i'm sorry pinot uh, pinot bianco and pinot nero and i have to say i went right from i took a sip of the extra dry and then i went to the to the just the brut or to yeah. the, i'm sorry the extra brut and then to the brut what a difference in flavors. The, the uh, Brut is, I almost, I know this is going to sound really weird. It goes against everything I know, but I immediately got a little note of berry fruit. I don't know why, <laughs> but I just got this little note of sort of, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a clear white wine, but, but it does have the two Pinots in there. And I'm wondering if that's what I, but I didn't even know, I didn't even look to see what was in it before I taste it. But I, it just seems like it's, um, is this a younger wine aged a little less than the extra bread? It just seems yeah. younger and more, just more basket full of fruit kind of thing. We're tasting a 2014 vintage. So it's a millesime wine. Um, there are seven years, almost eight years uh, behind this bar. And it's a Pinot Noir. And the second one, it's a regular brut, quote unquote. So it's just uh, 18 months age. And this is a fresh vintage in the market. Uh, uh, and uh, you have a discrepancy in the style. And this talking the grape, of course, the land, of course, but also the stage of life. Well, the wine, as we know, evolved. Evolved, changing is the script. Or something that was fresh becomes the or riper and then drier, right? As far as floral notes or fruits. So there is an evolution, a beautiful evolution. I actually, I had a a, a, a fantastic bottle with Catherine uh, in one of our events that we tasted 2001, uh, and I was extremely impressed after 20 years on the evolution of that wine, still spectacular. I don't want to promote they say what what was that, but if your guests, if our guests have questions more specifically about labels and producer off the records, I would love to answer to that. Great. And uh, uh, Barbara, um, Barbara Worley Travels has asked for the tasting notes. Barbara, I've got your, uh, your note here and I will communicate with you, with you on D, um, through direct message and get those notes to you. So you're sure to have them. So I just thought I'd throw that out there as well. Well, both of these wines, the first two wines are, are really, really lovely. Um, before we go to the rosé, do you want to start talking a little bit about uh, the growing area? I've got my map here to show oh, yeah. and we can talk about some things. Um, 
Yeah, but very briefly, we talked about this more in the, in the last Facebook event, and, uh, but I still want to mention, if you can pull them up uh, uh, kindly. This one? So that's, that's the Francia Corte, uh, the, the colored one, yes. This is the, the one you want? Okay. Colors, yeah, that, that beautiful mosaic. So first of all, see the shape. A glacier from north uh, melted heading south and opened up right after the lake. So you have this amphitheater shape I was describing before. And all those colors actually answer to a lot of questions. I think the biggest uh, work we can do is to turn the back to the label and see where located the producer, go online, see which vineyards are making what, because every color corresponds to a, to a soil. For example, the green colors you see, especially by the lake, are producing in the wine more floral notes, uh, while uh, the yellow color are more producing spiciness and vegetal notes. Or, or, or the, the blue ones are, are more, uh, if you want, uh, uh, more persistence in general in the wine. So. Uh, knowing what we're drinking and knowing where the vineyards are located, not easy, of course, but doable, you will also justify the description you find. So it's not only a job, thank you, Karen. <laughs> I would rather see now your smile. <laughs> I, I'm intrigued by the winemaking process and, and uh, oak or no oak, but where the vineyards are located is my, is my I don't know, my, my curiosity. Because in a floor, an explosion of floral nodes uh, can be justified by the position of the vineyard and the kind of soil. In that case, it will be a drain deposit in particular. So the website, by the way, franciacorta.net, it's, it's very well done. Uh, section in English, download uh, that map in high resolution. Uh, you can also find the different food and wine pairing that suggest you, as well as all the styles, the grapes, a bit of it. So go check it out, or even better, read our articles in the Napa Valley Academy uh, website. Yeah, I, and in fact, um, gosh, I don't, uh, maybe what I'll do, uh, I'll have to come up with a way of posting it uh, on the Academy, maybe in, uh, maybe in our story, um, or actually, I don't know how we'll do it. I'll talk to, I'll figure something out, and I'll post some of those links um, in, yeah. our, li in our bio link tree. So yeah. let me work on that uh, after the fact. So I'll make, because I know a lot of people are asking for the tasting notes, for the identification of the wine. So I'm writing all your names down and we'll get that to you when we finish. <laughs> well, as well, you can DM me as well and, and or email me. Um, it's, I'm going to mention my email now, uh, Gianmario with two M's, M -M, Gianmario at ucla.edu. Uh, email me and we go from there. You're a brave man, <laughs> that's all I can say. You are a brave man. Okay. Yeah. Well, last time. I even let's see. Hi, what else do we need to know? Um, there's a couple more pictures I have, and we have. I will. So now, do you want to? What do you want to? Where do you want to go next? You want to talk about sustainability and then taste the rosé? Uh, yeah. Let's talk briefly about the sustainability because uh, it, it's a big point. First of all, I mentioned. I mentioned the, the, the 62% actually of um, uh, vineyards certified organic over 3,000 hectares or so. It's an impressive number. Why? Because uh, family owned wineries that are making wine and drinking wine for generations are uh, investing in organic, in biological, in organic by default. Uh, being sustainable is something uh, that is mandatory these days because we have to protect our planet, okay? But in that area, sustainability was a necessity. Maybe now evolved on the use of technology such as solar panel, but the reuse of the water, uh, using green, uh, green manure, not real manure, green manure, or, or uh, growing uh, local flowers and plants in between the rows, it's something that belongs to the tradition. Then we can use the label of biodynamic. But I was impressed to visit a few times the area because there is the culture of respecting mother nature. And that is transfer as a form of love in the wine. I know a lot of times Italians fill their mouth with wonderful words like, you know, the beautiful life, the beauty and the, 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 the quality and so forth. But for Francia Corta, I really touch with my hands this part, this, this, this way of thinking. 
So uh, they also have, I don't know, consortium among all the, the tasks they need to fulfill. Also, there is a, a, a check, a, they're controller of the gas emission of each winery. But for, by, for years by now, they also invested on controlling uh, the, the workers. There is an ethical approach on, on, uh, on growing the wine. So there is a fair pay. I'm mentioning this because uh, around we had uh, several episodes of, uh, of uh, the opposite. You know, I don't want to go for the dark part of the wine business. But uh, in this area, they pay the work. Hours to dedicate are considered normal. Uh, there is a, a, a good ethic that you can taste then in the wine. It's a form of yeah. love. But you no know, love where they apply the organic approach, the sustainable approach, again, because themselves, they're the first drink in the wine. Yeah. You, it's almost, it's like the wine has a soul. The wine has a soul because people have soul. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's a rhetorical, if you want, but it's not automatic in every field, in every, even in the wine world. You don't see souls everywhere. So right. the search for the truth is something, is, uh, is part of Francia Corta for my, for my personal. That's why also I was glad and I took on board this challenge uh, when they offered me the position because it's a, it's a fantastic case history. There is work to do because there are a lot of competitors, but in the same time, you can be proud, chin up, because what is done is done very well. Yes, that's, that's, a, great, that's a great story. It really is. And, you know, that, that's something I think a lot of people, when they think of organic or sustainable, they start thinking really just of chemicals and you know production methods, but sustainability goes beyond organic in that regard, and really does. Talk, you know, you have to you have to prove that you're taking care of your your surrounding the surrounding area, your environment, the greater environment, carbon footprint, and your community. Are you contributing to your community, and are you taking care of the employees? Um, so it, it really does. Sustain, sustainability in general has soul, but French Accorda has soul. I like that. that, that was just, Came right to me. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Let's go visit. I, I I think I have to refresh my glass here. Oh darn! You poor thing. Working and uh, I have wonderful rosé, which will be my company, my date for the for the. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, first of all, uh, thanks to you, Karen, and a cheers to our friends uh, watching this Instagram live or the video they can download later in your, in your website. Yeah. Uh, cheers yeah. to a brighter future for everyone and to a great Francia Corta. Yes, cheers to that. Chin chin. And you know, the psychology of the visuals. You see Rosé, what are you looking for? Berries, wild berries, blueberries, um, tiny red crunchy fruits that crunch after you can uh, taste the perception of the acidity even higher. Yes. Very, a very extended palate. Here, actually, I would like to go for grilled fish if I can suggest a pairing. Uh, but, you know, forget about the fish for a moment. Pork cheeks. Oh. I don't know one is up to that, okay? Uh, I won't mention any other animals, but um, think out of the box. Start from the, the characteristic of the wine, from the descriptors and the style of the wine, and then there and go off the beaten path. It's not necessarily a, a, a fritto, fried calamari. It's not necessarily a toast wine. It's a wine that can your company during a, a, a main course and a full meal. Yes. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I like that you said the pork cheeks or even veal cheeks. That would be fantastic with this. In Emilia, Romanda, in Emilia Romagna, so I'm, I'm really uh, twisting my, my head between the seaside and the delicious blue fish and the tradition of the seafood with the wonderful tradition of prosciutto di Parma, coppa piacentina, and, and you name it, but even just pancetta. Yes. A, a pancetta and a glass of, of uh, Francia Corta Rosé. And I'm getting... Oh. I know it's 10.45 for you, but here is about... <laughs> Well, I, but I love the idea of the pancetta because you've got, you know, the, 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 the cured jamon or the dried jamon, and then you've got the, the little bit of um, that saltiness and the fat, the little fat thread running through it. Oh my God, that with this wine would be, 
I don't think I have any in my fridge. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to look. I don't know if I do, but um, that sounds like something I'm going to have to have later. <laughs> <laughs> Send me a photo with a glass of wine. I know we're heading to the end, so um, if there are any, any questions about Francia Corta or about the wines. By the way, I poured my glass uh, five minutes before we started, and the bubbles are still... Oh, yeah. So that's, there is one chain in particular. That's, yeah. that's, Mine are still going, too. That's the, I, I love to see that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's excellent. I have a question. So we, we have, uh, you know, it seems like every um, style of wine now is coming out with their own wine glass. And I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. But, um, you know, you, I'm happy to be drinking these out of a French Accorta glass. What is it about this glass that matches, that, that works so well with French Accorta? Do you, do you have an idea? Right. Uh, the flute is wonderful to see the bubbles running up the glass, but they don't allow the wine to express its character opening up. Uh, what, we, what we call uh, uh, jasmine or, or, or tropical fruit is actually a molecule coming up in the surface, breaking up the lines us of some descriptor. So the shape of this wine allows the bubble to run up, okay, but in the same time, uh, help the molecules breaking up to your nose. The, the shape keeps the aromatics instead of uh, dispersion of the aromatics. If the glass was, instead of a tulip was going up like a martini glass, there was a dispersion of the aromatics. This way you kind of contain and help the nose uh, reaching the aromas. The quality of the crystal, let me do it again. The quality of the crystal is a key point as well. So when Francia Corta designed the glass and committed to the, the, to the, to the maker, they really consider all the option where the aesthetic was part of it, but the functionality was actually the goal. It's yeah, and it's, yeah, it's a little hard to see on the screen, but I'm telling you, I poured this at 10 minutes till, so an hour ago, and yeah. I'm still getting fine bubbles parading up through the bottom of the glass. I've still got a little bit of mousse and I haven't refreshed this glass at all for an hour. And so it's, you know, really, persistent and you know i think a lot of people think because it gets wider that it's going to let all your bubbles escape but it really doesn't it actually help, holds up very very nicely so just I, wanted to sort of the bring word that parading up. i like what you say parading is very evocative word <laughs> i love that. <laughs> oh i come up with some good words every now and then <laughs> very very good so where you know people are listening to this and thinking gee i don't see french accorda on the shelf at the typical wine store, where, where should they look for it? Um, either a specific store or just in general, like where's a good place? While you're telling them that, I'm gonna show them this beautiful, you wanna know what French Accorda looks like, you have to go here. And that- picture a cold wind coming down the mountains and yes. in January. Um, well, because of our audience is everywhere in US and in the world and in California, of course, I won't mention a specific store. Let me put it this way. Major chains carry, carry major producers. So if you go into a major chain and you ask for a Francia Corta, they will have an option for you. They also will have more than one option for you. Uh, I would go for a different route. Go to your, uh, you know, I don't want to say high end, but in a wine, an Italian restaurant where you, you know there is a passion for the wine program because you might be able to find a more boutique producer. Yes. So start from an Italian restaurant where there is passion behind a wine list and, and, and uh, start from the Metodo Classico, try different ones and then go to France Accord and try to understand why it's so special. Go to your local wine shop. Let's support our local businesses, okay? Yes. Go to your wine uh, suggester, your wine helper. You can go with brands, you can go with names, we can go with style. You say, hey, I heard of Satin, France Accord. Do you have any? Ask him helps also the business carrying more wines as an option. So it's always good to ask what you're looking for, but also relying on their expertise as a local yes. business, both more on the peculiar, on the small production rather than the major player, will guarantee you uh, a, a better drink, in my opinion, and also a more democratic drink. In Francia Corta can be pretty democratic. If you drink a brut, you can go away with a great bottle and a moderate uh, amount of dollar you spend versus other 
famous product. Okay, then of course, if you climb up the ranking and you go for the Reserva, it's a special drink, okay? Right. So ask, in Italian we say, uh, chiedere metà dell'avere. Asking is half of obtaining. So go <laughs> right. what fits your taste first, okay? Yeah. If you know what. Yes, I think that's great. That's wonderful, really great advice. Now you were nice enough to give everyone your email address. Do you want to give it one more quick time? And also it, for those of you on, well, obviously everyone's on Instagram, you can just click on his name and that'll take you to his Instagram page and you can follow him there and DM him there. That's yeah. a really easy way to locate you. But do you want to share your email again? Yes, and you, by the way, you see how not often I post on Instagram, unfortunately. Um, my email is Gianmario, my first name with two M's, Gianmario at UCLA.edu. My last name is Villa, Gianmario Villa. I don't think there are many in the world with that name and last name. So probably <laughs> no. not. Just Google and find it. Yes, you, you will find him there. Um, well, so we, I, I don't even know how to thank you. I, 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 and I'm sorry, I, I should tell the audience that you and I have been talking. My husband and I are ready to travel again, and we are going to Franciacorta for sure. We're going to do the whole Northern Italy route, and you're nice enough to say, suggest that you'll offer me some good ideas when we, you know, when we get ready to plan it. Um, but I want to thank you, Jamario. So not just to work with you for Instagram today, but you know, you and I have talked a few times, and I've listened, I've sat in on your webinars before, and you are a breath of fresh air in the wine industry. You're so engaging and inspiring and you get people so enthusiastic about you know about French Accorta wines or pretty much anything you're talking about. Fred, <laughs> thank, well, thank you. It, it's a, it's a, it's truly a pleasure and an honor because I believe in the in the approach that you have and also on your personality and uh, we should work often with good, good with good souls and drink good wine with a soul. Well, I am, I am happy to drink and, and talk with you and interview you and just enjoy our company with each other anytime you want. Um, I want to thank the audience. You guys have been great. So many of you have hung around the whole hour, which is rare. And so that is a testimony to you, Joe Mario, for being such an interesting guest. Thanks to all the Academy peeps that are on here and the influencers. We appreciate you guys. Don't forget, sign up, go online, sign up. Actually, there's a link in the bio of the Academy, I believe, uh, for the Napa Valley Wine Academy. Make sure you're following Napa Valley Wine Academy online because we do advertise a lot of our things on Instagram and Facebook. But also go to our bio, find that newsletter link and sign up for our newsletter because that's where you're going to hear about all the upcoming events, including the next uh, webinar that uh, Jamara will be hosting. So, um, you know, find, find us because that's something that will be very valuable. If you're a student, you're already on our mailing list. But if you're not a student, I suggest you get there. Jamario, what can I say? I love you. <laughs> you are so fun. <laughs> this feeling is mutual. It's mutual. Uh, well, cheers, my friend. Follow. You have a wonderful time, wonderful day, and be safe. Same here to everyone. Ciao. Ciao.